What's going on, guys? Welcome to Cry About It, that podcast about all the sad music and things surrounding it and everything else that we love about the culture. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Jason DeVore from legendary West Coast punk, pop punk band, Authority Zero. Thanks for joining hey, us today. Thanks for having me, Joe. I appreciate it, man. So, Jason, I, I we talked a little bit beforehand. I was first introduced to your band um, from a Tony Hawk video game. I think Tony Hawk Underground. Yeah, yeah, it was it. So it was, that, like, the, uh, it was, like, the, it was like the B-side Tony Hawk game, but it was like, it was really cool because there was a lot of great bands on it. <laughs> I remember playing that, uh, yeah, the, the soundtrack was incredible. I remember that's like I was in college at that point, but I remember in my college house uh, with my roommate playing that game constantly, and yeah. that's kind of where I went and looked up all the bands that were on there, and and you guys kind of s- stuck with it. So I was really excited when uh, this interview popped up. Being over here in Pennsylvania, I've always been fascinated by the West Coast bands because a lot of people didn't make it over here as much. It always sure. just seemed like that SoCal <laughs> and the Arizona and that area like had such cool like a little more skater punk bands like than than we kind of at least where when i was growing up the, the bands on this side so yeah we actually played penn state one time when we were on tour it was like 2005 or four no probably 2004 okay we penn state out in the you guys had a giant field out there there's like this giant stage we got hired by the college to play and like i think like 10 kids came out in this giant field <laughs> but the light show was like fucking crazy it was like the sound was immaculate it was a huge stage it was, it was very memorable you guys i i really dove into it today and i i had always i knew the name and and i knew you guys just kind of on standing on your own i never realized some of the bands that you toured with you guys ran the gamut from every spectrum of the rock genre i thought that was really neat when i started looking at your touring history Everybody from No Use for a Name to Sum 41, even Everclear, I saw you guys toured with. Uh, oddly, it's a fun story with that one, just real quick. It's, it's the only tour we've ever dropped off of in our entire lives. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so it's a long story short, but we're talking about East Coast stuff, too. Um, so we were on tour with Everclear, and uh, we were playing. It was a college circuit again, you know. We were the opening band. We're the opening opening band. Okay. You know, so we, we pretty much played before the doors opened up. And so by the time we were done with our 20-minute set, mm-hmm five people would have chuckled in you know what i mean and we were, we were spending a lot of money and we didn't have really any at this time to, to go on tour and be on the tour and then um an opportunity arose with uh in jersey with um how was it called it's a jersey festival i can't remember the name of it but yeah bamboozle the bamboozle or skate and surf there were two big skate ones and surf. Skate, was, surf. Yeah, okay. skate, skate and surf so we got offered to play the skate and surf and we were kind of in the zone in that area at the time and uh, we had a long, hard talk with each other. We're like, we've never done this before, like, this to tour ever. We never planned to. And, uh, but it was like the Bouncing Souls were playing it. Goldfinger was playing it. Like, H2O was playing it. Bands that we should be playing with in our minds, especially that it's younger kids, would make a lot more sense. And it's a festival. You know, it was, it was just one festival. But it made all the difference to us in the world to play with those bands that we looked up to. And we were, you know along the same genre, at least. <laughs> so, Absolutely. We, so we jumped ship, and uh, my understanding is that uh, Art, Art, the singer of Everclear, went around just talking trash on us the rest of the tour, like, they don't care about their fans, this and that. These guys, fuck these guys, they suck. And I'm like, that's funny. Yeah. So that's, that's the one tour we ever dropped off of. But yes, yeah, Everclear we did play with as well, and uh, we've been with a lot of bands. <laughs> the one tour i i was did you guys play I, I saw that you did the no use for a name starting line tour did yeah that was awesome dude did I mean, you do the, the full tour i think we did the full tour yeah looking back it's yeah we did the full tour I, then i then, then i've seen you live before because I, I i saw that tour oh nice yeah yeah we were the opening band again on that one you know but uh that was a, that was a really fun one I'll be, again you know uh i think it was some 41 no use for a name starting line and us. It was great about it. Uh, we did a, we did a prank on No Use for a Name back then because we started we started just messing with each other, you know. And they got us good one night. I can't remember what they did, but I remember they got us pretty good. But then when they went on stage in I think uh, somewhere around I think Norfolk, Virginia area possibly. But when they were on stage, we went to their green room and we talked to the people that worked there. And they had this like giant green room. It was like this big big you know venue with some forty one playing obviously too. And uh, we asked them if they had any super, super solid rope. And so they had some rope and we hung all of their furniture to the ceiling while they were playing in their set. Like their couches, like their chairs, like their lamps, their, everything. It was like, so they got on stage and they came in the green room and like all the shit was just hanging from the ceiling. And uh, they actually brought it up in one of their interviews that that was one of the best pranks they've ever had on them before. So it's That's a pretty awesome. weird prank, but it was something something different. Yeah, <laughs> like you come off stage, you just want to sit down and crash and everything's hanging yeah. from the ceiling. Before you know it, you got a ceiling hanging from your 
ceiling and you're about to drop on your head. You guys uh, were on Lava Records, signed to Lava Records in, in the early 2000s. That, that label always fascinated me because, I mean, I know it and people from the scene, I think, know it for Simple Plan, right? Like that was that. Yeah. But they had everybody from like Trans-Siberian Orchestra and Blue Man Group. Uh, what, what was it like at that time, especially because um, you were on them before they were acquired by the major? Yes. Or, yeah. So what what yeah. what was it like at that time being part of that label? It was pretty awesome for us. I mean, just kids like we've been playing for seven years at this point since we were like 15, 14 years old, you know, and we just had turned 21. And uh, mm-hmm. all of a sudden we have some recognition from, you know, some or some at least attention, I'm sorry, from like labels in general, you know, that would just kind of blew our minds to begin with because we were still learning how to play our instruments and we'll figure out what we're doing, you know, really. Um, we were just having fun with it. So it was a pretty wild experience, man. When first Universal came out to see us play, because we, we got played on the radio here in town on 103.9 or 106.3 on a local spot uh, on Sunday. And then it got moved to like uh, an actual spot on the real radio on primetime. And so record labels started seeing that and they were wondering who the signed band was that was getting all this airplay. And so it got the attention of Love Atlantic or whatever, and then Universal Republic. And so Universal came out, watched us play, saw the crowd. The crowd was growing at that point. And then Lava came out and did the same thing. And both kind of put it as a uh, fair weather kind of fan base for a moment, just because it was like a interesting local thing, you know? They're like, oh, it'll blow over in no time. And then it kept on happening. And we kept on getting more, a new song on the radio uh, here locally. We had some great friends helping us out and working with us that were really kind enough to at least give us a chance. And then they both started coming back with offers. And then right when we thought we were going to go with Universal and Republic, uh, Lava came back with a better offer that made more sense as far as our, our, uh, creativity goes on top of that so we opted to go that direction and it was just crazy we hit the re- we hit the ground running we hadn't really we hadn't been on tour before so we hit the ground running we did like probably 200 and something crazy days the first year and for the, actually for the first four or five years uh, it was like non-stop touring and touring and touring and we just beat the hell out of ourselves and got to work you know and uh we really mostly toured the states they, they weren't a fan of getting us over into europe which is a bummer because like our our genre of punk rock or whatever in that time frame right at the peak or toward the end of it so it would have been perfect for us to get out there during that time to at least get the band noted, noted, known out there a bit more uh, but they just wanted to grind us they wanted to grind us in the u.s and canada so we just went around and around and around and around and around, and around you know and now we've been for the last like nine years uh hammering away in Europe as well as Japan and uh, things have been really growing really nicely but so back to the lava thing um it was really cool we were just excited a bunch of kids in a candy store you know and you know back then is when labels kind of gave you a little bonus so we were, <laughs> we, were we thought we just made it you know what I mean really it's like right. we're like oh that's it we're good you know little do we know like you know things change and uh you know if you want to keep on doing this uh music changed the uh industry changed and everything, you know, uh, touring changed, music styles changed, everything changed. So uh, in order to survive and to keep on doing what you love, and which is why we keep doing it, is you just got to keep on touring and sell your merch. Uh, we've been independent since 2006, I believe. And, uh, you know, kind of bouncing any label, any label through our friends. And uh, the last two records we put out uh, independently as, as well ourselves. I mean, you guys were doing it, like you said, seven years before you got signed. And then you got signed in like 2002 area? Uh, right 2001 or two, yeah. 2001 or two, two decades ago already. And you're still yeah. out there and still doing it. So I think that speaks to hustle and grind um, to have that longevity. There's there's not many bands, especially from that genre, that can say that. What, what do you accredit the longevity to? Uh, the fans, honestly, dude. The fans, I mean, if it wasn't for them being so hardcore about it and still uh, being you know, dedicated to like the music and now their kids coming out to the shows, which blows my mind. Their kids are like, some are like 16 years old now, you know, it's like, what the hell just happened? Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, our fans, uh, just dedication, honestly, man, and the love of, love of this music and the, the hard, it really is like the, the work ethic that's been in, put into it throughout all these years and just the progression of it and the, the development of the sound, the music, it just, it's always stayed interesting to me personally, you know, it's like, we keep on uh, trying new ideas, trying new sounds, trying new things. There's always something happening to where you have something to write about, let it be your own life or in the world and, you know, whatever. So the create the creativity hasn't gone out the window by any, by any means. It's always just kind of grown and flourished. I think, again, oddly, we've had band member change ups. And I, I think that not discrediting anybody in the band that's been in this group before or uh, original members, but I think that new blood coming into the band throughout the years has helped light another fire each time it's happened. It's much I hate seeing it happen. Uh, it's unfortunate, you know, it's a new process every time it's happened. Um, 
but it does bring a new fire, you know, someone that's really excited to be a part of something that we've been working on so hard for so long uh, and to help make it, take it to the next level. And uh, that's what we're always trying to do is just keep on taking it to the next level. Uh, Cause if you're not doing that this many years later, you're just kind of hanging out. <laughs> you know? yeah. it's like it's like oh this sounds better than your last stuff it's like well if we're not getting better then there's no point in this <laughs> right. it's, it's kind of it's kind of all we've done <laughs> so you had mentioned that there's always something going on in the world to write about if i remember correctly you guys i think we're on a, a fat record split about oh, uh, the talking, war in iraq right i got what you're talking about it was uh the rock against bush volume two with, yes uh, with about records yeah yeah so that song here's the, th- the thing about that song too it's funny i actually have a skate deck right here it's a revolution skate deck Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, the song is called Revolution. And it's funny because a lot of our music, it sounds like it's extremely political. Uh, it does have that, that tinge to it. It obviously does come from a place of that nature as well. But a lot of the music in general is, like the song Revolution essentially was written as a personal revolution. It's about making a change within yourself. Because I mean, a lot of the songs also that I write lyrically, oddly are kind of talking to myself, you know, like going through hardships and like trying to figure out if I want to, if I want to make my life better, feel better about situation I'm in that I got to make that change myself because no one around me is going to do it for me. You know, when you want a revolution, you got to make a difference on your own. And that can go across the board. Like you say, politically, it can go individually. It can go as far as like groups go or you name it. And that's the way I like to write as much as possible is to keep it open-minded to uh, free thinking for everybody to kind of take away what they can from it rather than just me shoving politics down their throat because I'm no politician. You know, I just, I see what I see. What I, see. I like what I like and I, like, I don't like what I don't like. And I just kind of write about off of that. I write off emotion, not about uh, uh, political agendas or anything of that nature. It's more just about uh, if you want to do something good, if you're not happy with things that are going on the way they are, uh, it's up to you to make that change. Um, and ultimately, it's, no one's going to be there for you to do it. And that, well, that's what stuck out about that song to me. Of, of most of the songs on there, uh, it really popped out because it wasn't right on the nose. It made you think about more than just, you know, it wasn't telling you like, this is bad because of this. It was more think about it. And like you said, it, it could, that revolution could be applied to anything from that comp. That song always stuck out to me. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. So, it's, again, just, you know, it's, it, that's what I like to do is like you say, like kind of get people thinking and is he talking about this? Is he telling me something or is it like, you know, there's something else I'm supposed to be thinking and taking away from this. Or is it like just this one thing? I love doing that. I think it's a fun way of writing. It's like kind of more, a poetic way of writing. And I love songs like that because then people can apply it to what they need and when they need it. We are an internet show. Shock value helps so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> over all these years, as you said, you guys have kind of been road dogs almost 30 years now. What, like anything that you're just like, I can't believe that happened. I've got a couple. They're not like really uplifting, but it's, it's kind of interesting. These are things that have actually happened on the road. Yeah. Uh, my old guitar player is like one of our last days on tour. Uh, we were all partying our faces off because it was like it was like one of those shows like it was the last one in the middle of nowhere there was like really three people there and so we just got shit faced we drank like five bottles of Jägermeister and then played our show and just I don't even know we played we played whatever we wanted to like probably not even our songs and they probably weren't anybody else's songs either (laughs) but we got hammered that night and we knew we were going home we went on the road for like a month and a half at this point in time I think and uh like I said we were out of our minds a bit and then uh things went south and a guitar player went out uh, out and about I'm not gonna name names but he went out and about and uh, he came back late and he got upset about something and he couldn't get in the hotel room and we were all passed out and so he punched the window and it slid his wrist and when he, when he pulled back through the window yeah and it cut a major artery and so we're like all of us are just what are we supposed to do here do we call the cops or do we do we drive him to the hospital like he's, he's bleeding out really heavily like a lot they finally get in the car get in, to get him in the van and somebody had to drive so I'm not sure who it was, but they started racing toward the hospital. And somebody who was with us called the cops because they were worried about them driving to the hospital. And then the cops, so the cops ended up pulling them over while he's bleeding out in the van. It's like all over the front seat. It's crazy. And he's like already turning blue, you know. So and they, got, they, they told him what was going on and they escorted him to the hospital and they saved his life, thank God. Um, but it was a crazy moment. And uh, he lost like four quarts of, four pints of blood or something. Wow. So that's like, that's like all you can lose before it's like that's it. Yeah, so he was getting, uh, he was a close one. So that was one crazy thing that will always stand out in my mind because that was the day we almost lost my buddy. The last, the next one would be, uh, we flipped our van uh, about two years ago. We were on tour going through Wyoming with our friends Counterpunch out of Chicago. And uh, luckily they had, we were using their gear. They had the trailer. We didn't have a trailer cast our our van. And uh, I was asleep in the back of the bus, or the back of the van. We have each of our little, you know, seats that were still intact that are little, our little bunks. 
And um, I'm like laying there sleeping. And then all of a sudden I feel like a jerk. I kind of wake up a little bit. And then next thing I know, I'm just flying through the air uh, toward the window in front of me where my feet were at and smashed my head against the window. And uh, it was like, <laughs> it was one of those moments. It was like famous last words would have been, what the fuck? That's, a, that's what I said when I was flying out of a dead sleep toward the window. <laughs> right. So had we kept on flipping and flipping, we only flipped one time, luckily, and we slammed it over our side. Uh, just opened my eyes and like looked down the, 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 the hallway or whatever, you know, and I just see everything that was under the seats, like just all against the window, like bodies like upside down. And first thing I did was like, be like, I'm like, everybody sound off. Are you okay? Uh, I'm like, sound off. And then everybody's like, ah, 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 you know, so everybody was good. We got bumps and scra scrapes and stuff and piled out of the back of the van. Luckily, oddly enough, I never say this, but there was a state trooper behind us because we were in the middle of nowhere he pulled he pulled aside and he got us out there we're all shook up and just freaking out giving each other hugs like love you man uh, and uh he gave us all tickets for not wearing seatbelts right there <laughs> we're all shook up we're like you man. kidding me dude? yeah uh, come on that was a break and we're like yeah. out of our minds yeah a little bit of so, compassion at that point right yeah so they, they get a truck out there it's just to pull the truck back over a crane or something just to flip our van back over on its uh, wheels it's still drivable it's still starting the side's all crushed in. You can't open the sliding glass door or the front driver's door, uh, passenger door. So we all have to pile back in this thing and drive it to the next station, which is like 45 miles down the road. And it's a station. It's like the one little shack that's like for the next town two hours away. And mind you, we had a show in uh, Colorado Springs that night. And so we get to this place and uh, my drummer, Dally, was really especially shook up. He was like in the front seat behind the two seats in the driver's area. He first didn't want to get back in the van and then he did because he knew we had to get there. But then we uh, get there, and this guy comes out in his overalls, kicks the tires out. Well, still works. <laughs> We're like, yeah, he's all, drive to the next town, you'll be fine. And I'm like, are you, are you serious right now, dude? We just got, we almost died in this thing. And uh, again, especially my drummer, Dally, he was like, I'm not getting back in that thing. No. I'm like, Dally, he told us, like, if we want to rent something even, it's like, it's two hours away to the next town, let alone trying to get a rental from right here to make that happen and then get to the show on time tonight. So we all just piled back in the van and drove it, made it to the show on time and rock and rolled that night. <laughs> just wow. drove, it the rest, drove it the rest of the tour that way. A couple of cool, crazy stories from the road. Couldn't imagine yeah. just w waking up out of a sleep as you're, as you're in a barrel roll in a van. It was wild, dude. I did, it was like one of those, this is it. You know, it's like, yeah. I, made it, I made it this many years and this, this is the one. You know, it's like, can't get that lucky that many times. So yeah. let's talk about these new songs you guys have coming out. I, I checked out... Uh, Ali Ali Oxen Free, mm -hmm. great jam. How's that? Thank how is much. how's the reception been so far? It's been out about a month now. Yeah, Ali's been out for about a month. That was the first one we released, and it's been really good. People were excited. It was you know it's the opening track to our album. It's our album title track. Yeah, it's just it's been really great reception. We haven't heard a lot of you know flack back, I guess or whatever. It's been a lot of positive uh, vibes back this way about it, and uh, they're just like excited because it's kind of got an old school, uh, old school night late nineties punk kind of vibe to it, you know. So. People were excited to hear that and uh, saying it sounds like old Authority Zero stuff, which, you know, kids always like to hear the older stuff from bands, it seems. Right. So that was, a nice, that was a nice compliment to hear. And then I, I was really excited to check out uh, Fire Off Another, yeah. another great song. And you guys, uh, you worked with Cameron Webb on that. We did. Yeah, he did our uh, album in 2016 um, for uh, The Tipping Point. Okay. I think it was, yeah, it was, it was 10 years ago. I know that. So, so no, longer than that then. So you further back but uh that was one thing we talked about i'm like i haven't talked to you in 10 years dude i'm like it's been 10 years so yeah it was just fun, fun to get back in with him and it just picked up where we, where we left off you know and just had a great time recording with him yeah and i love his sounds i love his the way he produces is really unique he does it like a, in a very mad scientist kind of way okay you know especially, especially when it gets late at night you know first he's like he, he asks you questions he, he doesn't give you the answers he asks you questions like well, what else you got like what else, what would you do there i'm like i just did it you know <laughs> that's what i would do there you know, so, but he makes you think, he makes you reevaluate what you, what you, what you think is the best option and makes you come up with something even better, which uh, it's, it's a really nice way to do it rather than a producer just telling you like, this is what should go there. As much as you want the ideas and the feedback, because you think you're out of ideas, it does rattle your brain and make you come up with something else. For anybody listening, I mean, he's worked with everybody from Motorhead to listeners of this uh, day to remember uh, yeah. on the punk side. Pennywise, so yeah. he's be been around the block. Um, so that's 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 a great name to to have have attached. Yeah, he's a great guy. With. Absolutely, yeah. he's become a good friend over the years, and he's just he's just a lot of fun to work with. So any bands looking to work, he's a guy. 
<laughs> so what is the what is the writing process like? Is it is it more you kind of put everything down and then bring the band in, or is it a collaborative effort? It's a collaborative effort, man. It always has been. I mean, that's what made this band so unique. I think in the beginning was we all had different styles of music. We really partic- were particular about, I guess, and like uh, favored. And you know, everything metal from metal to hip hop to funk to blues to jazz to punk to rock. You know, it's like I was always like the skate punk guy. I always wanted to be. If it's not fast, it's no good. That's when I was younger, you know. And then. Uh, you know, Bill, a guitar player back in the day, was big of the Chili Peppers and, and things of that nature too. You know, and like blue, a lot of blues stuff. Uh, bass player Jimmy back in the day also was another like, uh, typo negative, Megadeth, Metallica. You know, big time metalhead. And uh, our drummer was like in the hip hop and thrash, thrash, old old school thrash punk. You know, so it was always a fun eclectic mix. And it's funny because over the years, as we all just hung out and wrote together, we all rubbed off on each other to where like I started liking more of the reggae stuff and things of that nature too along the way and uh more of the mid tempo kind of things and some of the other guys started liking more of the fast stuff so just like it we all just learned from each other and became this really cool morphing of, a, of an idea of a of a musical personality with each one of us so it's kind of carried on throughout so with the writing process now it's, uh, it's changed up quite a bit again with people coming and going uh, here and there throughout the years uh this last record was really myself and mike um my bass player mike sparrow uh, writing this record just in the downtime we've had um, just through uh, garage band and over on the internet you know just like things like that and he'd come to my place and we'd like lay down some stuff on just like scratch vocals and he'd write a lot of guitar parts um, a lot a great deal of guitar parts uh, he actually played guitar on this album as well as bass because we were in between guitar players at the time but we wanted to make sure we got this album done and he did a freaking amazing job doing double duty on that with the bass and the guitars um, and so that's how it went with this one. We pretty much like wrote the music first and then I would write some actual songs just on my acoustic here at home, you know, with lyrics as well as melodies and the guitar lit riff. And then he'd make it twice as cool because he plays guitar like a actual guitar player does. And uh, we just kind of mashed them together. We'd bring him to Dally, our drummer. And uh, Dally wrote some drum parts that were really cool that really kicked off the album actually with Ollie Ollie Oxen Free. And we smashed them all together. We would do like one practice a month or something if we could have Dally come out here to California and we'd get together and just kind of go through things. and. That's pretty much how it's gone. Yeah, <laughs> it's very, awesome. it's very organic. Yeah, it's yeah. very organic. It was, it was very simple. It came really naturally, which was really nice. And we had the time to actually take our time on it and do it the way we wanted to do it. That's great. I always find uh, writing processes fascinating because some people I speak to, it's like John goes into a room and writes it by himself, and then we come in and play his parts. Whereas other people, it's organic, or there, there's all different. There's so many ways about it. So I always. I find that fascinating. And something that's always stuck out, stuck out um, about Authority Zero for me is the, the reggae influence. And mm-hmm. I, I, what I, I think you explained it a little bit, and, and I like that you touched on it, is you guys are, you're, you're a punk band that with like reggae elements. Like I think a lot of people try to lump the, or, or throw that ska label around, especially the time that you guys kind of broke. Like that sound was... Was was a little more prevalent. Where uh, where where did the the reggae influence for the band kind of develop? It came from everywhere, uh, band wise. As far as like the bands we were listening to, I mean, have been listening to still to this day. You know, bands like uh, Rancid, Operation Ivy, uh, Sublime, obviously. You know, like uh, Bob Marley. Just a lot of the traditional reggae stuff too. And um, it all it all kind of it all makes sense though. You know, it's like it's like you said with reggae and punk. It's like they're both like kind of aggressive music in some regard but in different ways given the culture of it you know what i mean so right. it's it's interesting you wouldn't think they would make sense together but with that idea in mind that they make complete sense together you know and uh again i think you know bands like like rancid like uh you know Op Ivy, stuff like that again those are like a lot of the big ones and sublime obviously too you know they all did a really good job of incorporating those elements into music without making it sound like it was happening accidentally and it just made sense and somehow we always we always kind of didn't pride ourselves on that idea in mind too, but we, we always tried to throw curveballs. We, we have those moments where we do it just because we're like, fuck it, let's just do a breakdown right here that's like a jazz version, a jazz moment. You know, just because, why not? Who cares? It's music. You know, and um, we've always tried to make it a pretty smooth transition to make where the listener can just go on a ride. You know what I mean? And like, it's just like, because it's boring for us too. You can't just, I mean, to us, if you just play a straight punk song with 13 songs, it's the same song to me over and over again, just with a different message, or maybe even the same exact message. But if you sing it a little bit different with some reggae to it, it's a completely different monster now. And it's like, it's going to be more interesting for you to play it as well as for the listener to hear it 
and just uh, just more creative, I guess. You know, it gives you more to, more ear candy, I guess, all around. <laughs> Absolutely. And plus, so, it gives me a chance. To, it gives me a chance to actually sing instead of just scream at people. First. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and I love singing, so you know. <laughs> Always enjoyable. So yeah. what what should fans um, maybe if they're just hearing about you now? What should they expect moving forward for the band? Is there a drop date yet? It's dropping January, or I'm sorry, June 18th is the drop date for that. Okay. So keep your ears to the ground and it'll be on authorityzero.com and all that fun stuff for uh, the release and all that. Um, but yeah, for the future, for what we have in store is we have this new album. Obviously, we've been working really hard on it. We just got the hard copies today. I got one in my hand. It was pretty, well, it's in the kitchen, but I got to pick it up today and I got to actually see what the hard work came to and became and put it in my CD player for a minute. So very happy with it, very stoked. And uh, that's gonna bring us to pretty much our 25 year anniversary was two years ago. And we were supposed to go on this big 25 year tour around the world, uh, Europe, Japan, uh, Korea, um, States, obviously too, Canada, but that all got put on hold, obviously. And uh, this year it's been put on hold again with Europe. With Europe. So it'll be again next 2022 probably. Um, but we are looking to go to Japan again in November and uh, hopefully do some West Coast states, maybe for a couple of weeks in December. And uh, we'll have videos, music videos coming up for our, our singles as well, as well as lyric, lyric videos, uh, new merch, new, yeah, new merch, new merch stuff too. So keep, it's also gonna be on our website for things like that, but just ultimately more new music and um, more rock, man. Well, thank you so much for taking the time yeah, to speak with me today. And I uh, look forward to seeing the band as, as for the next 25 years, right? That's right, man. Still exactly. got it. Still got it in me. Exactly. I always say I'll keep singing until the voice goes out. Yeah. 